This 10th year of Daily Tech News Show is made possible by its listeners. Thanks to all of you, including Mike Akins, Norm Fazekas, and Chris Allen. Coming up on DTNS CES 2023, 18-inch laptops. And Ayaz Akhtar helps us understand why Microsoft says it doesn't know when Call of Duty launched. This is the Daily Tech News for Tuesday, January 3rd, 2023. Beginning our 10th year in Los Angeles, I'm Tom Merritt. From New York City, I'm Ayaz Akhtar. And I'm the show's producer, as always, Roger Chang. And we shall start. I'm glad it's as always. If you were not suddenly Roger Chang, I would be... It would be an ex- interesting plot twist. It would be disconcerting. <laughs> Watch out for season 11. <laughs> maybe maybe next year. We'll see. Uh, let's start with a few things coming out of CES 2023 in the quick hits. Samsung is showing off a 57-inch ultra-wide 32 by 9 aspect ratio Odyssey Neo G9. That's the name of that 57-inch monitor. It is a 57-inch monitor. Uh, the mini LED s- display uh, better give you 8K resolution at that size. Uh, it has 240 hertz refresh rate, one millisecond response time, one million to one contrast ratio, as well as a matte display so it doesn't glare. Uh, Samsung claims it'll be the first display with DisplayPort 2.1 support, but it will not be the last. You're going to hear a lot of DisplayPort 2.1 support this week. No price or release date on that yet. Samsung also announced a 40-inch curved OLED with a 32 by 9 aspect ratio a new version of its smart monitor with personalized home content, and Samsung's first 5K monitor with a wide color gamut of 99% DCI-P3 and HDR600 support. You want to talk OLEDs? Let's talk OLEDs. LG announced new OLED TVs with improved brightness. LG's OLEDs have some of the best contrast and black levels in the business, but OLED screens aren't as bright as LCD screens. To address that, LG promises the new G3 TV is up to 70% brighter than the G2. The more affordable LG C3 gets a processor upgrade for better picture quality. And the WebOS software that runs LG TVs is getting better ways to group its apps and more personalized recommendations. LG will also support QMS VRR, which gets rid of the black screen you you see when you change between videos with different frame rates. LG also announced new laptops in its Gram line, the 14, 15, 16, and 17-inch models. The Gram Style is a new variant with a glass design and a trackpad that lights when you touch it. The new LG Gram models launch worldwide in February. No prices are known yet. Uh, One of the big announcements at every CES lately has been chips, and Intel announced the Raptor Lake processors for laptops. Uh, Well, let's look at the flagship. That's the one everybody always pays the most attention to, even though no one (laughs) buys it because it's the most expensive. Uh, Core i9-13980HX has a 5.6 gigahertz turbo frequency and 24 cores. I know there's one person out there going, I'm going to buy it. Well, good for you. Intel claims it's the world's fastest mobile processor. We'll see about that. The new flagship has the same number of performance cores as the previous gen, but double the efficiency cores. It supports up to 128 gigabytes of DDR4 and a DDR5 RAM in a 55 watt chip. And you can overclock all four chips in the HX series, just like you can with the HK series. The 13th gen chips work with existing motherboards and existing power and cooling requirements, meaning it'll be easier for manufacturers to switch over to them. Intel also introduced the N series in the 13th generation. That's a replacement for Pentium and Celeron chips. Those are the ones still being used in education and entry-level machines, so think Chromebooks. They'll also appear in Internet of Things devices, so you'll see N-series 13th gen chips in store signage, kiosks, copiers, security devices, stuff like that. A couple other notes. CNET's Lori Grunin points out that Intel's Evo program, that's the one that certifies laptops to be you know, efficient and powerful, uh, now allows for third-party graphics cards. You can be Evo certified even if you have an AMD or NVIDIA GPU. And they're going to certify accessory providers, uh, people who make Thunderbolt 4 docks, mice, keyboards, stuff like that, that you can get Evo certification for those as well. The 13th gen processors also bring along support for Thunderbolt 4 and therefore DisplayPort 2.1, as well as 20 gigabit per second USB uh, and Intel's Unison which lets you uh, share iPhone and Android functions like texts and photo transfers with your PC. Evo being opened up. Acer has ditched the Swift 3 and Swift 5 naming scheme in favor of a more conventional method of including the screen size in the name. The Swift... The Swift Go 14 and 16 are the new names of new mainstream machines, and the Swift 14 and Swift 
X14 are 14-inch versions of Acer's mid-range and top-of-the-line systems. These are coming in May and June. The Nitro gaming laptops are now the Nitro 16 and Nitro 17. Those have 13th gen Intel processors and NVIDIA 40 series GPUs and arrive in the U.S. in May starting at $1,200. And if you want LED backlights on your keyboard and the top-of-the-line specs all around, check out the 16-inch and 18-inch Helios models, which start at $1,650 and $1,700 respectively. They're coming to the U.S. in March. Sadly, perhaps, Acer is keeping the Aspire laptop line as Aspire 3 and Aspire 5. Oh, and the Aspire models are now only available with Intel CPUs. No more AMD options. Interesting. I wonder how Intel swung that. Uh, Dell showed off a prototype under the Nix name, NYX. It's a PC gamepad. Has the usual buttons and analog sticks and stuff, but also adds things like a fingerprint sensor under the central button, touch sensors and scroll wheels, innovative ways of doing controls. Uh, there's also a Nix workstation set up that uses glasses-free 3D displays and a depth sensing camera so that you can have an avatar of you in real time and experience a VR-like workspace, but without needing a headset. Those are both prototypes, but Dell also showed off stuff you can actually buy. Dell's got new Alienware Legend gaming laptops, including one model with an 18-inch screen. Uh, these have options for top-level 13th Gen Intel HX CPUs, as well as those 40 series NVIDIA GPUs. Uh, there's also 14 and 16-inch models of the Alienware Legend, uh, including the X16, which has a tall 16x10 display. These are all coming this quarter, uh, with all but the base-level X14 starting above $2,000. That M18, the 18-inch one, starts at $2,899. And if you want that tall 16x10 display, the X16 starts at $3,099. Now, now, if you'd like to spend less money on a gaming laptop, Dell has an option for you there too. G Series offers a blocky, kind of 80s looking retro design with 13th gen Intel chips, RTX 40 series GPUs. The G15 starts at 849 and the G16 starts at 1499 Though those prices are going to go up if you want the Intel 13th Gen and NVIDIA 40 series GPUs. Uh, they also offer two terabyte NVMe storage options. They go on sale this quarter and versions with AMD chips will be coming in Q2. Dell has some other stuff here. They also introduced a 24 and a half inch 500 hertz gaming monitor. 500 hertz. This might be actually the first 500 hertz to go on sale. Others have been announced before. It's got a fast IPS screen coming to China February 8th and North America March 21st. Dell's new 32 inch 6K monitor is being compared to the Apple Pro Display XDR. It's a 6144 by 3456 monitor using uh, LG's IPS black technology. No price on any of those yet. And then there's the Dell Ultra Sharp uh, coming in Q2. That's what that one is. The Dell Ultra Sharp coming in Q2. And what this price is going to be for that uh, 500 megahertz. Mm. <laughs> okay, so one early trend to see uh, seems to be the 18 inch laptop because Razer also announced new Blade gaming laptops in 16 and 18 inch sizes. As you would expect, they run on 13th gen HX Intel CPUs and 40 series NVIDIA RTX GPUs. And Asus announced its Strix line of laptops now come in 16 and 18 inch models, along with improved cooling to push higher frame rates. Like ROG Zephyrus M16 and Zephyrus G14 have Nebula HDR displays. Matter is a cross-platform standard we've talked about on the show before. It'll eventually make it simple to set up all your smart devices with whatever you've got, but you need everybody to roll out the support they've promised for that to start working. And in the first of what will likely be many Matter <laughs> compatibility announcements from smart home device makers at CES, GE Lighting said that Matter support will come to new versions of its Sync, that's C-Y-N-C, Sync Direct Connect Smart Bulbs and Smart Plugs. It will not come to existing sync devices. And new versions of Direct Connect smart bulbs and plugs will support Matter later this year. All right, we do have a couple of things that are not from CES 2023, right? Go figure. Starting on March March 1st, that is starting on March 1st, Apple, let me try that again. Starting on March 1st, Apple will raise the price of out-of-warranty battery replacements for iPhone 13 models and older. The price for iPhone battery replacements will rise from $69 to $89. MacBook Air replacements will also increase by $30 and iPads by $20. The price increases will not affect customers with Apple Care. 
And Arlo announced that next year, okay, so they're giving you a year, January 1st, 2024, Arlo cameras will no longer offer seven days free cloud storage. Uh, Arlo also says it reserves the right to eliminate any of its free cloud features like email alerts and push notifications for any camera that it stopped making more than four years ago. So the free ride, even though it was on the box when you bought it, is now Ah, the Consumer Electronics Show, CES. It officially opens Thursday, if, you, if you're confused. Uh, Thursday, January 5th is when it opens. But press events always start early. And like South Carolina trying to beat Iowa as the first U.S. presidential primary, NVIDIA swiped the spot as the first CES press event on Monday. Uh, let's talk about what NVIDIA announced at its virtual press event today. Sure thing. We got the name change we expected. NVIDIA announced its mid-range RTX 4070 Ti GPU on Tuesday, which is exactly the same as the card formerly known as the 12 gigabyte RTX 4080. That's the one that everyone complained was confusingly named. So now it's called the 4070 Ti. If you can't afford or don't want to spend money on a 4080 or 4090, you can now get a card that claims to play Cyberpunk 2077 three times as fast as the 3090 Ti. You won't get 4K support, but you will get 1440p and 120 frames per second thanks to DLSS3. The NVIDIA RTX 4070 Ti is available starting January 5th with a suggested retail price of $799. That's 100 bucks less than what was called the 4080. So, I mean, I guess the complaining worked. I thought it was a little silly that people were upset about the name. I'm like, they're just going to put out the same thing. But they did put it out at a $100 discount. Uh, so, I don't know. Maybe they were trying to get away with something by calling it the 4080 uh, and then being able to put another 100 bucks on top of that. Or just the supply chain math worked out differently and the delay caused them to to calculate a new price. That's also possible. But, uh, yeah, it's, it's a nice, I wouldn't say mid-range, uh, but it's a nice afford a more less money alternative to the top end ones it certainly is a thing that costs less <laughs> it's definitely a thing that costs less uh nvidia also made some interesting announcements around its geforce now game streaming platform uh what is now called the rtx 3080 tier uh is going to be called the geforce now ultimate tier but the price is going to stay the same. Uh, they <laughs> change the name here did not get you a discount. It's still going to be twenty dollars a month. Your games will soon stream from machines with RTX forty eighty GPUs, though, and they aren't raising the price for that. Uh, that includes support for full ray tracing, DLSS three, and two hundred forty frames per second. Nvidia also said that a two hundred forty hertz mode should have latency less than forty milliseconds. Existing tier subscribers will get automatically upgraded uh, once this comes along. If you're in the U.S., that should happen sometime time at the end of the month and if you're elsewhere in north america and western europe it'll come in q1 and they haven't announced a schedule for anywhere else i like that they're actually bothering to try to upgrade geforce now because that thing's kind of been mm, a little messy i'm gonna say yeah uh, people are, seem to be huge fans of it right but but they uh, uh but uh, I, I i get mixed reviews from it and it is nice to see them blazing the trail and not just giving up on it uh like maybe some other companies would do if they had a cloud gaming streaming service that was about to sunset in two or three weeks <laughs> uh you know what you'll be able to play geforce now games from the front dashboard or rear seat entertainment systems in cars from hyundai Kia, Genesis, Polestar, and BYD. NVIDIA says that any car that has at least a 4G connection and a browser in its entertainment system should be able to access GeForce Now. So, of course, though, play in the front seat will be limited to when you're parked. No date was set for this. Interesting Game idea. Game streaming in the car is one of the things that cloud gaming makes more practical, right? You don't have to put like high end specs in there. You just either need a good strong Wi-Fi connection, which lots of cars have, uh, or a, a, you know, probably a 5G. I know they said at least 4G, but I'll be honest, you're 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 probably going to want a 5G connection in there to to make the best use of it. But then yeah, I wonder what the control scheme, how that's going to work. Uh how your controller is going to going to connect and usability and all that, but not bad, right? NVIDIA really wants to be in the auto industry, and it is. It is now. They're going to cram themselves in cars no matter what. <laughs> yeah. It's going to happen. 
Uh, robot simulators are an essential thing. We've talked about this on DTNS over the past year. Uh, if you want to develop your, your intelligent software to guide robots, uh, you want to do it in a risk-free environment, uh, something that is not as expensive as testing in the real world and, and get it safe, you know, because it's, it's dangerous to test stuff in the real world if you're not really sure it's going to work. NVIDIA has a platform called Isaac Sim, and it has added virtual humans to that sim so that you can not only prepare your robot in a realistic situation, but you can test things like collision avoidance with those unpredictable organic coworkers. The sim is also adding the ability to render real-time sensor data, including simulating different lighting conditions and reflective materials. You can also add different existing robots and warehouse parts to better recreate the actual physical area that you're going to operate in. All new features are available for developers to use right now in Isaac Sim. I kind of want to try this out for like more like dinner parties, see how they go and see. Uh, <laughs> just use of, the human part. Yeah, less yeah. of the robots, more of the unpredictable. Like, hey, that guy just, he's, he's choking on an olive pit. Ah, you know what to do. Yeah. If, if you're if you're a developer who's who's trying to figure out good machine learning for, for robotics in a warehouse, this is really exciting. For the rest of us, we just want to play around with the virtual humans. And- <laughs> That's, that's what I'd like to try. Uh, so Omniverse is NVIDIA's platform for creating virtual worlds, also known as the metaverse. If you want to use the appropriate buzzword, it uses the open source universal scene description, which means objects you create in Omniverse can be exchanged across platforms. NVIDIA had a few announcements around the Omniverse. The Avatar Cloud Engine, or ACE, is a generative AI that makes it easier to add intelligence and animation to any avatar. Developers can register now for early access to ACE when it's available. The Unity Omniverse Connector is also available now to take advantage of the Unity game engine in Omniverse. And Mercedes-Benz plans to use Omniverse to create a digital twin of one of its German car factories so it can better plan out building the real thing. Oh, it's kind of similar to the robot thing. You want to simulate something and get it really good before you actually do it. Uh, I kind of love that uh, as, a, as, a, as a reason to use something called the metaverse, uh, in this case, Omniverse. Uh, create a, a good simulation of the factory so you know where things go i mean uh, on a smaller level we've all experienced that in wanting to be able to simulate our living rooms and we want to buy new furniture and stuff like that so yeah on, on a factory level it's much more complicated you need something like omniverse works for me all right samsung is showing off its latest foldable screen prototype this is what people come to ces for the flex hybrid oled can fold on one side and slide out on the other. So you can change not only the size, but also the aspect ratio. Now, Samsung's not the first one to ever do this. We've seen this at CES from other companies before, but Samsung has a good track record of actually taking these things and making them at least a slight success in the marketplace. When folded, it's a 4.2 inch screen. That's not bad. That's something you can slide in a pocket pretty easily. It then can unfold to be a 10.5 inch 4x3 tablet display. That's workable. That's the kind of thing that most people buy when they buy a tablet. They buy something around 9 to 11 inches. It can then slide out from one side to become a 12.4 inch 16x10 display. That's like your iPad Pro size. That's the like, I really want this to work like a laptop size. But it's all in one device. Samsung will also be showing off a couple other prototypes that they have showed off before. The Flex Slidable Solo, that's a 14-inch OLED panel that can slide out to be a 17.3-inch display. And then the Flex Slidable Duet OLED, uh, it does the same thing by sliding out from both sides of the display. So you can you can kind of adjust uh, different ways. These are all prototypes. Uh, Samsung may or may not put these into its own or into others' actual devices, uh, but there's a better chance of these showing up than some of the other things you may see. Yeah, I mean, Samsung's been messing around with foldable or flexible OLEDs for a really long time. I remember seeing a really old video, probably like a 640 by 480 style of video of a flexible OLED, somebody taking a hammer to it to show, oh, it's really robust. It's it's interesting to see these kinds of devices because I think with Samsung's essentially R&D and all of the, the real world feedback they've gotten with their flexible devices, they're finding out, okay, so what are the use case scenarios? When are people going to need this? A 4.2 inch screen is kind of a nice small, small-ish phone, small now, and a and a, the tablet size sounds about perfect. So if you can have the best of both worlds, you've got one device that does everything you need. That's pretty neat. I'm also curious if they would bother to have 
it be a secondary display. So if you want to connect it to a, a PC, mm. that could be something that'd be neat. It just gives you a lot of options that you normally wouldn't have. But again, though, use case scenarios, I think this is more real world than why do I need a scrolling thing? This is why, because it's always good to have a, a larger screen on the inside. A lot of the objections to these foldable displays were the crease or the hinge. Remember mm -hmm. the first version of the fold had had really bad hinge problems. Uh, and, and Samsung, Samsung weathers these storms. Remember, they had lithium ion batteries that blew up in uh, 2016. And everyone said, oh, the note, you'll never sell the note. Well, the note sold for years and years after that. They were able to bounce back from that. They bounce back from the hinge. The crease gets smaller every time. It doesn't seem to bother as many people as maybe you thought uh, what I wonder here, though, is what's this 12.4 inch screen good for without a keyboard? And if you have a keyboard, how does that fit in? Because one of the advantages here is like, oh, I've got this very small phone like device that's easy to cart, cart around that unfolds into a bigger tablet. But if I also have to carry a, a, a keyboard, then suddenly that advantage is is reduced a little. Yeah, I see your point there. I mean, unless there was like a case that included some kind of flip keyboard that came out of it or some kind of magnetic attachment, something like a Surface Pro, that would be something. Now you're, now you're starting to add more and more bulk when you're carrying this. I know there was these really old versions of these uh, laser projectors. They would fire out a keyboard on a, on a flat oh, surface. Yeah. Uh -huh. Those are a really cool idea, but they didn't really take off too well because there's, you know, people like keyboard travel. And if you're hitting a you know, flat piece of anything, it's not, there's no travel. Then again, you know, when you're typing on a glass screen, there's not a heck of a lot to travel unless you're like really, really smacking <laughs> the thing, I guess. So uh, maybe this would be another thing that Samsung could essentially teach the world what to deal with. Because like you were talking about with the creases, you know, at first we were like, oh, it's got a crease, it's got a crease. And we're like, oh, it's not so bad. Then it got even less, it's not as, as pronounced. Oh, it's not so bad. And then by the third or fourth generation, we're like, eh, yeah, we can live with that. Because now we're so used to this idea of like, yeah, wait a second, I am carrying a tablet in my, my pocket. Like that wasn't a thing. Unless, again, now I'm talking about large pockets, but it was not a normal thing. So I think Samsung had really come up with some cool, uh, innovative ways to add a keyboard if they wanted to. Yeah, and, and Willie Scott uh, in the chat says, I, I wonder if tablets are now becoming more laptop computers and phones are the new tablets. Uh, that's an interesting way to look at it. Maybe if you need a keyboard, well, then you should probably just get a regular tablet. Uh, but if if you just want to be able to access a tablet every once in a while and you're not worried about the keyboard, well, then then a foldable with a slidable or a flex or whatever we end up calling this uh, hybrid of multiple things. I think they just all fold under foldables uh, is, is something that could be up your alley. Uh, folks, if you have a thought about what you would use this for, uh, give us an email or give us an email about anything. Honestly, whatever's on your mind, email us feedback at dailytechnewsshow.com. As Microsoft recognizes its first ever union, Communication Workers of America is now the bargaining representative for the quality assurance employees at ZeniMax. It's being a little stickler in its flight or its fight rather to acquire Activision. A line in Microsoft's court filing over its acquisition of Activision Blizzard has gotten a lot of attention. So let's talk about what you need to know to understand this story. The U.S. Federal Trade Commission has filed a lawsuit to stop Microsoft's acquisition of Activision Blizzard. That's how the FTC works. It files lawsuits. So that's, that's not the weird part. It just means the FTC wants to stop this. In that lawsuit, it makes a lot of justifications for its arguments. And among those justifications are that Microsoft getting control of Call of, a Call of Duty in particular would be bad for the gaming marketplace as it would contribute to too much control being on one place. The entire case doesn't rest on Call of Duty, but this is an important part of the filing. To justify that assertion, the FTC asserts that, and here I quote, by any measure, Call of Duty is a leading AAA franchise. And it cites the kind of facts you might expect in support of that. $27 billion in revenue between 2003 and 2020, several million monthly active users, and dominating the list of top console games sold between 2010 and 2019. So I ask, how did Microsoft respond to this part about Call of Duty? Uh, very lawyerly uh, in its filing, Microsoft wrote that, quote, it lacks knowledge or information sufficient to form a belief as to the truth of the allegations concerning industry perceptions of Call of Duty and Call of Duty's original release date, or as to the truth of the of the allegations concerning Call of Duty's launch and typical release schedule. And then the quote ends. It just kept going for a while, included revenue and user figures and, and that kind of stuff. It refers the court to the FTC's documents for the accuracy of any of these and denies all other allegations in the relevant paragraphs. 
<laughs> that is very lawyerly and and denying uh, in the filing that they can tell, like, we don't know when Call of Duty was originally released. You just got to rely on the FTC. They're going to have to prove that uh, is very amusing. I'm not going to lie. That's funny. But remember, this is a court filing. This isn't them just, you know, walking into a bar and saying that Microsoft appears to be saying that they deny all the allegations in the FTC filing except the stuff that's beyond Microsoft's responsibility to know. They're not going to deny when Call of Duty launched. They're going to say, hey, it's not that Microsoft can't find out that stuff. It's not our job to do that. If the FTC wants to use that fact, they have to prove it. We're not going to stipulate it. Uh, Matt Stoller, who campaigns against monopolies, called it nasty and petty. So I, as you passed the bar once, I know you're not a practicing attorney anymore, but what do you think? Is is this just Microsoft being legally cautious, you know, dotting their I's and crossing their T's? Or do you think Stoller's right that it's kind of legally aggressive? And being cautious again, remember, I'm not a practicing attorney. I've been retired officially for years, so the law might have changed. So just, just bear with me right now. Uh, I think Microsoft was, uh, I went to having a good time writing this, or at least their lawyers were, but they were being extremely, uh, let's say they were splitting hairs, a lot of splitting of hairs, because one of the things when I was looking at the response, Microsoft claimed that a AAA game is not a, an industry defined term. Now, that's what the FTC said is an industry defined term. So I could see Microsoft saying, hey, listen, that term does exist. People do use it, but we don't have an actual industry definition as to what this is. So to split hairs on this level and every single in every single paragraph of the FTC uh, complaint, it seems uh, it seems like petty sounds about right. Nasty. I don't know about that. It seems like it's splitting hairs. But like I've said thousands of times before, the precision of language is extremely important in any legal filings whatsoever. So if Microsoft says we know that this date was the date, like what ramifications would that even have? at all to the case. I'm not even sure why that was in there or needed to be in there, but they needed to hit dress point by point by point everything that the FTC wrote about, because otherwise it would be, hey, you didn't say if uh, you knew that, you didn't say that, and they're going to have this little petty infighting crap that you don't need. Then again, you know this is probably going to end up with some kind of concessions and maybe a settlement, assuming it doesn't destroy competition. Yeah, I, I think that may be the only thing that's really surprising here is, is is not that they're claiming not to know when Call of Duty launched. Of course they know. Uh, it's that they could, I, I tell me if I'm wrong, but I think they could have just stipulated like, well, the, we'll stipulate that the facts in there are correct because it doesn't matter for our argument. Our argument is this isn't a monopoly. But instead, they kind of went the extra mile of like, we're not, we're going to, you want to win this, you got to work for it. So you're going to have to prove every single element, which allows certain things to be thrown out if they can't prove them, which then would undermine the argument. Like it it does seem like Microsoft is pulling out all the stops by doing that. If I remember the complaint right, I don't believe that the FTC specified exactly the date. They said it's like it's launch cycle. Yeah, they just said a year. Yeah. Right. Yeah. So that would be something that's if they stipulated it, then they have to like, they can't stipulate something that the, that the complaint doesn't have. So you got to uh, then say yeah, this okay. is, so there's like, it essentially would be extra work. So basically saying, yeah, you said whatever, we don't, we're not bothering with that. So I guess it could just be a way to quickly get this. <laughs> could it be that done? they think the FTC filing is sloppy and they're like, we're not going to stipulate that because you might be wrong. <laughs> And we I don't mean, I, be I, can't, for it. I can't say why they would do it, but I could just, <laughs> yeah, yeah. I could just say that the idea of in my, we, we start saying this stuff again. I'm like, wait a minute. If I, if it's not specific in there, yep. do I mm-hmm. want to run the risk of ticking off the FTC right now? I'm trying to pull off a $70 billion deal to get a mm-hmm. massive game publisher. Let me, let me, let me get something wrong here. <laughs> And they could pick at it. It's like, do I want that? Nah, we don't no. even know when this came out. That's not what we're going to talk about. We, <laughs> when would Microsoft have learned this officially? Like, did we learn it today in the Google search? Or, like, I just don't know. It's about uh, not. So in that case, what you're saying is that it's about not leaving any openings for the FTC to go after. I would. That's what I would be because that's just being mm-hmm. cautious. Again, this is trying to get a $70 billion deal done. Yeah, yeah. All right. Uh, Let's check out the mailbag. On our year-end prediction show, Will Smith made a prediction related to computational audio. John wrote in to point out an existing contender for what Will wants. Uh, John said, I was recently looking to upgrade from a 3.1 soundbar to a full surround system and almost purchased this Sony HT-A9 set plus their wireless subwoofer, which promises a 12 plus speaker sound from four devices. So 4.0.4 plus subwoofer all through computational audio, reading the speakers 
and their surroundings. The only reason I didn't go with it was because I have a vaulted ceiling and an open living room. I was very tempted as the reviews are pretty good, and I think Will Smith is right that there are a lot of ways this could really change how home audio is done. If there is a second product released in 2023 that does this, he'll get an easy one point in next year's predictions results episode. I've been listening to every episode since day one of both DTNS and TNT, and very happy to have Ayaz back regularly. Uh, the DTNS team is awesome, and your shows keep getting better. Thank you, thank you, John. Uh, John is also Spafnukia in uh, Twitch. If you ever join in our Twitch chat, and and they're there as well. Uh, but but yeah, I. I'm going to guess Will knew about this and maybe was making a, a wider, like this will become more frequent or better. Maybe you just get it out of one speaker. Uh, but this is nice. This is a good point that that Will's definitely on the right track. Yeah, if you're interested in the Sony's, how it actually performs in these kinds of open spaces, vaulted ceilings, uh, go to YouTube, check out Techmoan. It's, uh, that channel's been around forever. He had a similar version of the Sony system and he even had oddball systems, oddball spaces. And he was surprised by the results of how good it was. So yeah, computational uh, audio, I think could get better, but like as long as it, what it costs right now is kind of ridiculous. It'd be nice to have the yeah. little small dinky speakers like we were talking about seem like monster speakers. And thank you, John. I do like being back regularly. <laughs> yes, John is right about so many things on this. Fantastic. Uh, thank you, Ayaz, uh, for being with us today. Before we let you go, uh, what else do you have going on this week? Uh, everyone should go to thisoldnerd.com. But last time I said that, people went there and the site went down. So go to thisoldnerd.com. St stagger that, please. And uh, there I do a show called This Old Nerd. And the idea behind it is you want to have the most tech forward home and life possible. Well, that's what this show is all about. Life is short, so we make sure that the projects can be accomplished relatively quickly because I usually fail like a thousand times and then I show you the way it actually worked. That makes it a lot easier for everybody watching. So check out this old nerd at thisoldnerd.com. Let IAS fail so you don't have to. I love that. Uh, thanks to our brand new bosses. Of course, we uh, we haven't had a live show in a couple oh, week and a half or so. So thanks to all the folks who joined in on the Patreon over the break. Glad you enjoyed those holiday episodes. Greg, Robert, Dan, John, Alex, Nicholas, Daniel, Peter, all just started backing us on Patreon. So thank you, Greg, Robert, Dan, John, Alex, Nicholas, Daniel, and Peter. You are going to get... Good Day Internet, the extended show that starts mere moments away. You can also catch the show live Monday through Friday, 4 p.m. Eastern, 2100 UTC at dailytechnewsshow.com slash live. Back tomorrow with more CES and gadgets. Sherlin Lowe will be joining us, as will Rich Straffolino from Las Vegas. Talk to you then. This show is part of the Frog Pants Network. Get more at frogpants.com. Diamond Club hopes you have enjoyed this program. <laughs>